Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, today, uh, welcome to uh, the um, Computing Research in Industry Roundtable organized by CRA uh, Industry. Uh, I'll be moderating, uh, filling in Ben who had a family emergency. Uh, my name is Fatma Özcan. Um, can we go to the next slide? Alan? Okay, thank you. So, um, Basically, what we would like, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about CRA industry. We are a new um, uh, committee under uh, the Computer uh, Research Association formed about two years ago. Uh, we have, um, and the ma main mission of, uh, of uh, uh, CRA industry is uh, bringing academia, government, and industry uh, in this <laughs> nice uh, three pillar picture in industry partners on uh, research topics and connect them with industry, uh, uh, being uh, connecting them with both academia and government um, constituents uh, who basic uh, um, companies of all sizes and industries. So we are not targeting just the big ones. We are basically uh, uh, interested in all uh, uh, industrial partners. And uh, we are basically uh, trying to um, Um, we, we, are, uh, uh, we are trying to convene members to share different perspectives and form consensus on emerging topics. We basically um, uh, like to discuss what uh, people are um, working on and what is the uh, uh, what, uh, what is the main driving things that are kind of going on. And we are also coordinating with other CRA stakeholders. We have a, a, a workshop in February that we are co-organizing with, uh, with CCC and some of the other uh, CRA, uh, CRA uh, uh, widening participation uh, uh, on uh, accessibility. So when we have uh, topics of interest uh, that's cutting across multiple CRA uh, teams, we are also providing the link. So with that, um, how do we do uh, what we are trying to do? We are basically uh, uh, conducting interviews and brainstorming sessions with various stakeholders. Uh, we are convening uh, roundtables like this one and organizing workshops. We, uh, we already did a couple of roundtables and there's more information on our website. And uh, the goal of this is basically producing white papers or reports. Uh, the, uh, 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 basically, uh, we had, a, for example, we had a workshop on uh, uh, cloud computing, uh, best practices in cl cloud computing, and wrote a uh, white paper on best practices. So that's sort of uh, the main goal. Next one, please. So today, uh, our uh, roundtable is uh, uh, research in industry. and. Uh, we would like to basically, the goal of this, uh, this uh, roundtable today is to look at how research is conducted in various organizations, how problems are selected, how people are intensive, uh, incentivized, and how do you basically uh, uh, have internal external impact, uh, internal to the company, but also have external academic impact as well. And uh, another thing is the industrial research is, uh, diff uh, we believe it has uh, key differences from academic research, and we would like to discuss those uh, and uh, also discuss how we can uh, basically help uh, faculty prepare their students best for industrial research jobs. With that, can we move on? Okay. So today, what we are going to do is, after my <laughs> five-minute uh, overview, uh, we are going to go around. We have four finalists. Each one of them will basically introduce themselves and their organizations. Then we have a uh, uh, we have a bunch of uh, questions that we have uh, prepared to, for discussion today. We are going to go through them, and then we are going to open it for question and uh, Q and A, uh, general Q and A. So um, for Attendees, uh, please uh, type your questions in the uh, Zoom Q&A. We are going to get to those questions after we go through uh, the uh, discussion of topics in the Q&A session. And we are also uh, be, uh, recording this, and this is, uh, recording is going to be available on our website. Okay, so with that, um, I would like, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome uh, four uh, distinguished uh, members of uh, the, on this uh, round table. 
Um, Lisa Amini is, is the director of IBM Re uh, Research Cambridge. Uh, ben Carteret, uh, who is a senior research manager at Spotify. Jamie Thielen, who is a chief uh, scientist and technical fellow at Microsoft. And Manuela Veloso, who is the head of uh, JP Morgan Chase AI Research. So with that, I would like to give uh, our, our panelists the floor. Uh, Lisa, let's go around uh, and start with you. Okay, great. Thanks, Fatma. And uh, yes, as you said, uh, I'm Lisa Amini. I'm the lab director for IBM Research Cambridge. Uh, I've been with IBM Research for about uh, over 25 years, including much of the time at our main research site, which is in uh, Yorktown, New York. I also started the IBM Research Ireland lab in 2010. And addition, in addition to leading the lab here, I also lead our global research strategy for scaling and automating AI. Uh, it's fairly common for leaders in IBM Research to have both a line management role as well as a research strategy that would be matrix across our labs uh, because we have roughly 3,000 researchers worldwide in 13 labs, seven continents, um, and so it's important for us to to have you know a, you know a global strategy as well as our our line management. Key focus areas for IBM Research are uh, AI, uh, hybrid cloud or distributed systems, uh, quantum security, and our researchers collaborate uh, extensively with academia. So we have very large initiatives such as the MIT IBM Lab, along with what we refer to as our AI Horizons network of major partnerships with academics. So uh, UIUC, Mila, UMass, UCSD, RPI, and, and others, uh, which, which I also lead. Um, and these are along with smaller programs, uh, you know, directly between our researchers and selected faculty. We have internships, externships, PhD fellowships. So we have really a, a broad swath of ways that we collaborate with uh, academia. And all of our research collaborations with universities um, are to fund collaborative research, right? So where our researchers are working shoulder to shoulder with academic researchers, so faculty and, and students, right? So uh, and that's because, you know, we are a, a research organization, right? So uh, we pursue a lot of the same things that academic researchers would uh, pursue, uh, you know, attempting to advance, um, you know, science or technology in our chosen field, uh, publications in top conferences and journals, uh, uh, competing in AI challenges or benchmarks, releasing open source or open data to kind of further uh, the field. Uh, and in fact, some of our researchers have been recognized with uh, touring awards, uh, national medals of uh, science or technology, Nobel laureates, and, and so on. So it's it's really important that we're not so much on a model where we would pay academia to do the research for us, but instead what we do is we collaborate such that uh, we, we actually are working together on the, the um, projects. Um, however, the, you know, there are some things that are, uh, you know, different. We, we, you know, we do look to harness our algorithms or technologies or systems uh, that we create uh, in IBM products were applicable, and we probably do more uh, patenting of our research, you know, in addition to the publications. Um, it's not that everything we do into products, um, but I think that probably when people think of goal-oriented research, I that would probably be a good way um, to describe the research that we would do here in, in IBM research. And, and also it's a choice, right? So researchers may orient more towards uh, you know, science goals may orient more towards uh, business impact, and uh, we try to have constructs that would uh, incentivize and recognize both of those. Thank you, Lisa. Shall we move on to Ben? Hi, thank you. Um, so I am a senior research manager at Spotify. Um, I uh, am part of a research organization called Tech Research, which is part of the personalization mission in Spotify. And the mission is aimed at improving search and recommendations and personalization for all of Spotify's 250 million daily active users. Uh, the mission itself is about 500 or 600 people. Research within the mission is a fairly new and uh, still fairly small organization. We're about 35 full-time researchers. And um, we, because we're small and um, because we're new, we try to be really clear, really lean and, um, and really impactful. Um, so we work very closely with the product teams, work very closely with the teams that own the search recommendation products at Spotify. 
And in case you don't know, by the way, Spotify owns, you know, Spotify is a music and podcast catalog. So we do search and recommendations over music and um, and podcasts. And um, and so research works very closely with the product teams to help improve the product, bring innovative models into the product, um, better understand user behavior, better understand metrics, and um, generally just contribute in every way we can. Um, my background is uh, academic. So before I joined Spotify, I was a professor from 2008 through 2017. And um, as a professor, I was a pretty academic researcher focused on evaluation and experimentation of search systems. And uh, I joined Spotify on my sabbatical in 2017 um, as a visiting research scientist. And um, I liked it so much that I just decided to leave academia entirely and uh, stay full time at Spotify. Um, so the culture is great. The research, you know, the research culture is great. The product culture is great. And um, I really enjoy working with the rest of the team there. Uh, my team specifically, um, I lead a team of research scientists as a line manager. We work on problems around search and recommendation specifically. Some of the other research teams in our organization work on natural language processing or human computer interaction or um, core machine learning or semantic uh, technologies. Um, and then um, and then I also help to uh, direct our overall directions in research. So I, I am I'm charged with figuring out what our major uh, research pillars are going to be for the year and um, helping to make sure that those are aligned with the product strategies and the company strategies. So, um, so research at Spotify is, it is separate from, from the product organizations. They're not researchers permanently embedded in product teams, but researchers can move around between product teams to help out. We have found that our most productive collaborations and our best collaborations are started by having a research scientist embed with a product team at the very beginning of the life cycle of some product or technology, and then working closely with that product team throughout the life cycle um, to bring it, you know, to ship something. Um, we've had a lot of success with that model, and then the research scientist can choose after that point, you know, after something is shipped, generally the research scientist can choose to de-embed from the team and work with a different team or to continue working with that team on a new problem or um, uh, or just focus more on core research. We do publish a lot of papers. We value external impact. We value uh, participation in research communities. And we have published a lot of papers. Um, some of our best papers, you know, some of the papers I'm most proud of are papers that have been done in collaboration with product teams and have a large number of authors, but those authors are research scientists and ML engineers and data engineers and data scientists. Um, so I think we do, a, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the way that we collaborate with teams and get them involved in research while we also get involved in the product development and, um, and uh, shipping. Um, let's see, what else could I say? Um, I think that about covers it for me. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Jamie? Yes, hello, I'm uh, Jamie T. Van. And it's actually, as, as Fatma mentioned, it's fun to see uh, the different sizes of research organizations that we've got here, and also even the different industries. So it's great, we've got Manuela as well uh, from the finance industry. And I really think it highlights how important computing research is to, um, to, to the world, to different organizations, um, to big companies and small companies and not just tech companies. Uh, you know, there was, there's a statistic that's been true for a while and is probably even more true than I knew it before that um, more software engineers are hired into non-tech companies than get hired into tech companies. Um, and, and I would say, the pace of innovation right now, um, as well as the ability to really observe and respond to behavior in large scale data with the with the shift to the cloud that's been made over the past, you know, 15 ish years um, really makes computing research important. Um, at Microsoft, which is where I am, uh, uh, research has been fundamentally important for decades. Uh, Microsoft Research, you're probably familiar with, was founded over three decades ago. Bill Gates, who um, founded Microsoft, 
is deeply invested in uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, Microsoft Research does really creativity-driven research and is thinking about um, long-term, what are the questions our products should be having? What kind of, are the problems our company should be solving before we even know uh, that they're, uh, that those are questions? And I spent the start of my career in Microsoft Research, so I was there for um, over 11 years. And um, then, uh, uh, you know, at that point, um, one of the things that was becoming obvious is that research is is important not just um, not just to look ahead to the disruptions, but it's becoming it has increasingly become fundamental to how everything gets built and how everything gets done. So Satya Nadella, our CEO, um, asked me to take on this role as chief scientist to think about applied research in our core products, and I think it shows the importance of um, research to our company and actually is, is almost a natural extension of a cultural change that Satya has been driving at Microsoft since he's been CEO. He's really been interested in um, making the company more focused on learning and growth. We have a growth mindset, which is, you know, I know um, a lot of us are thinking about, but that is, and the, and, and the growth mindset is really a science mindset. It's thinking about how we can experiment, how we can build on what is known, how we can share what we learn. Um, and so I stepped in to uh, create the Office of Applied Research, where we're thinking about, um, about how we build more impact-driven research. So I, I thought it was interesting listening to Lisa talk about goal-oriented uh, research as well, um, the different ways that we think of it, the way I kind of think of it as the creativity-driven research, the bottoms-up uh, driven research, um, and then also looking at the impact-driven research that tends to be a little more top-down and driven to directly address the um, the challenges. So if you think of the creativity driven is like, what questions should we be asking? Um, the impact driven may be more of like, what are the questions that we have to answer right now and how we how we go um, about answering them? Um, we have two key goals when we think about applied research in the organization. One is to drive research back in back to innovation in our core products. So that's very much thinking about what are the big problems and, and um, how do we support that? There's a ton of research that happens across the company too. Um, so Microsoft research being sort of our, uh, you know, a, a, a strong externally facing research organization, but there's research that happens in the product teams, there's user research, there's market research. There's research, particularly when you think about how work practices have changed over uh, the past couple of years, there's research that's happening in facilities and uh, within HR. To, um, to think about the, the internal impact that work practice changes have had. And so um, really thinking about how to, how to bring and support those different kinds of research together to, to drive towards important problems for the company. And then the other key goal is um, to ensure that Microsoft is a world-class applied research organization and that this is where folks want to come um, to have a difference in the world as well. So we're both a world-class uh, sort of this disruptive research and um, a world-class applied uh, research. And, you know, applied research is actually um, deeply interesting, not, not only because of, um, you know, how much need we've had in, in increasing times, but also like, it's just a really fun place to do research. And I think that's what you've heard from Lisa and uh, Ben, you know, there's, it, it's, it, the you really get access to, um, a different scale of data and a different scale of compute and a different scale of potential impact, a different and a different kind of impact um, by working through uh, products. And uh, that's something that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, we have uh, to, to ensure that we're a world-class applied research organization. We have a bunch of programs that we run. We help support um, you know, hiring and talent development of researchers in the organization. We think about publication. It's I'm excited actually when I think about this um, CRA industry group for all the opportunities to sort of share best practices across how research happens in different organizations so that we can learn um, and, and share with each other. Um, you know, so so there's a lot, a lot doing a, a lot to do there to bring to bring the growth mindset and the scientist mindset to the entire organization. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, and our last uh, panelist, Manuela. 
Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> Hi, uh, so uh, my name is Manuela Voloso, and uh, I am currently the head of uh, JP Morgan Chase AI research. So the, it's computing research, but from an, uh, an AI perspective, AI and machine learning AI research. Uh, we are um, a group that uh, is um, uh, four years old. So I came to JP Morgan in 2018, July 2018 from academia. So uh, I was um, at, um, I mean, I'm, I'm an American professor at, at Carnegie Mellon University and uh, in the computer science and in uh, the machine learning department. So in the School of Computer Science in robotics too. And therefore, and, and then I came to JP Morgan. Um, the the mission one way or another that we have uh, in a company that uh, has AI in many uh, teams closer to the business, our mission was more to think about uh, more transformative, um, transformative um, kind of like uh, how do you say solutions, trying to understand what's not available necessarily off the shelf or with some fintech company or uh, with some kind of like develop engineering development, but things that are more, uh, um, that require more research uh, on the actual kind of like um, uh, what the problem entails with respect to the science we know of AI. So that's how we function. And then uh, we uh, basically, I just want to share because other people mentioned these, that we, we basically address problems of two. There are here a lot of chats. I don't know if I, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to fix these. Anyway, so uh, what happens is that basically uh, we uh, address problems which are either initiated by the business. So they actually uh, talk about like specific uh, types of problems and then we get engaged working with the business on how should they be solved. One way or another problems that are of a complexity that maybe uh, there is uh, the, 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 the budget to, or there is the interest of the applied team uh, it cannot cover these problems. So they are more long-term thinking problems. Or we actually start also with a, 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 a problem, uh, projects initiated by our own team. So we have both business initiated projects and AI research initiated projects. And uh, those are based on some uh, understanding we have of the business. Uh, we say, oh, what if we could do this? What if we could look at uh, this problem as images and try to support decision-making with images? So uh, this uh, something like uh, that, it's not the business that necessarily asked us to do this, but it's basically we uh, motivated by the business problems want to investigate something to then go back to the business and say, oh, you can do it like that. So we have these two types of projects that we do in my team. Uh, we currently are 100 people by the end of 2022. And uh, out of which we are, I believe all, I, mean, I believe now I know, we are about like 60% uh, PhD in computer science, um, AI, machine learning, engineering, math, uh, statistics, and the other 40% we are masters in the same areas. So it's a team that grew from um, one person to be a hundred and we might grow a little bit more to have some gray mass to think about all these problems and can address a, a, a large range of problems within uh, the firm. And uh, we all have as, uh, I just finished by telling you that we all have as mission also a, a change of culture, trying to educate people about AI. So. I built a, with my team, an AI academy, which is uh, small courses on crucial ideas in AI. So we, we and uh, so our mission includes this AI academy and, uh, and also uh, the connections with academia. So I also started when I joined these uh, faculty research awards for collaborations with faculty. Uh, we make a call for uh, proposals and then we basically fund gifts. Uh, to these different type of like um, uh, faculty to establish a, a relationship, to understand, to share the problems we have, to understand the research they're doing. And it has been very fruitful. We have uh, currently already like um, um, 
collaborated with more than 100 faculty uh, global all over the world, not just in the US because JP Morgan Chase is also global, JP Morgan is global. And then also we created for the first time the Faculty Jewish Research Award, uh, no, the Faculty PhD Fellowships, the, the, I'm sorry, sorry, the JP Morgan Chase PhD Fellowships and uh, for, uh, uh, the, for uh, grad students uh, that um, who, again, we have invitations, people submit applications and then we select a very small a number of, of, of PhD fellows. So I, we have the mission of the culture chance internally for the AI Academy. We, pro, we have projects of the nature initiated by us or initiated by the business. And literally we have all these connections with academia. As a final thought, uh, I just want to say that uh, to organize AI within the financial world, we created like these um, uh, seven uh, research uh, aspirational goals, so aspirational kind of like long-term goals to pursue, which three of them are very related to the financial industry itself. So like AI to eradicate financial crime, AI to share data safely, and AI basically to, um, um, to uh, think or to study large economic systems. And so these three are aspirational goals. How do we get AI to work on these three areas? And then we have three that are uh, basically common to any service industry, how, but in particular to the finance industry and how AI can empower our own employees in their jobs. How can AI basically um, um, you know, perfect the client experience and uh, the, all the clients we have, companies, individuals, and then how can AI also help with the regulators? So we have these three stakeholders, employees, employers, and um, you know, employees, customers, and regulators, and how do we do this? And then we have a seventh overarching research aspirational goal in which AI, how can AI um, include and uh, um, comply with uh, societal, societal values like trust, bias, explainability, all sorts of like um, ethics, uh, ESG. So all the things that are not necessarily part of the financial industry, but they are part of what are the values uh, in society that we need to abide by. And that is an overarching goal so that when we develop the AI and machines that eventually perform tasks in the industry, they comply with these types of values. So, you know, so that's basically uh, what we are, how we bring research to the company. And, um, uh, and, and that's basically how we function. And I'm very excited to be in this panel and share with you this type of like bringing research to the company. The boundaries, just to finish the boundaries between uh, AI research and applied AI, no, applied research and applied AI are sometimes fuzzy so that uh, people who work in the applied AI teams next to the business many times, uh, of course, address very complex problems and investigate complex decisions, complex uh, solutions, uh, applied research. We don't have applied research necessarily. So either it's research or applied AI. Uh, so AI research or applied AI, we don't have that slice that Jamie was mentioning. But even like between AI research and applied AI, the boundaries sometimes are more fuzzy than one would think because uh, you know we solve problems like applied AI does and they do some kind of investigation uh, uh, like we do. So it's, um, it's more like the horizon of problems we try to solve. Uh, applied AI try to go like uh, to solve problems of horizon three, not immediate and maybe, uh, uh, I'm sorry, AI research try to solve problems of horizon three and maybe applied AI tries to solve problems of uh, horizon one and two, and we do two and three and so forth. So it's um, it's how we function here. So I said it all. <laughs> Thank you, Manella. So uh, Alan, if you could show us. So today we have five questions that we want to go through. And the way we are going to is we have a lead. One of our uh, panelists will basically take the question first, then we are going to get the opinions of the other panelists. And uh, we have about 40 minutes to uh, uh, go through this. Uh, with that, let's go to, let's start with the first problem, um, problem selection. How do you basically choose problems to work on? Do you basically go top down, bottom up? How do you uh, basically incorporate the business goals and uh, business objectives? 
and to you basically the individual group. So with that uh, question, uh, let's start with Manuela, if you start. Yeah, so and I I think so I already uh, answered a little bit this question. Uh, basically with this type of like either our business initiated or or uh, AI research initiated projects. What I want to you all to understand is that even like within the AI research uh, initiated projects, we don't really research on going to Mars or autonomous driving, or we only we research on problems of relevance to the financial industry. Uh, and so it's uh, it's the domain itself that constrains, but it's not that the business asks us, oh, can you do trading with images? Or can you do all sorts of like uh, uh, reading public source, uh, public information on the web to extract and sentiment analysis about companies or mining all sorts of like different types of documents. So they didn't explicitly ask us for this, but knowing what they do, we go like that. Now, there is a very important question about also like, uh, which problems. I did not reach a, level, a point where um, I have more problems than what we can address, but I do want to explain one thing about problems the way we do in AI research, and I think it's important to think about research like this also in any company. We look at problems trying to abstract what the real problem is. So we try to um, uh, so uh, it, independently from the particular use case needed, like this group needs like these documents to be analyzed or searched, we then become like, uh, okay, let's focus on any document. How do you search any document? Uh, how do you do these types of like business constraints? And like, so we try to separate the business use case from the general technique and try to then reuse that general technique in multiple business use cases. Then in fact, expand this uh, general technique and publish it and uh, share with the research community, uh, with the academic community and try to actually learn from them too. So our approach to selection of problems is that, okay, we think about things, uh, the business asks us for things, but our emphasis as research unit is to abstract to the, the core problem being solved. And, uh, and then eventually that core solution leads us to have, uh, to introduce in the firm, to have like a marketplace of capabilities, which is what we want to push for, which is these things exist. Uh, now we can uh, read websites and extract information for websites for whatever matching you need to do. And then it becomes beyond a specific use case. So that's how we look at problems. You know, they come full of details. We go up and then we come down again on multiple use cases. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to add anything? Well, um, I love. Oh, go for it. Go, Jamie. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna. I'll, I'll be quick too. But I was gonna say I love that point about an abstraction, and it's one of the interesting challenges. Is actually. Um, the problems that product teams are working on get expressed differently than you know how we might think of a problem in the academic literature. And it's really interesting to think about how you draw those connections. So when you think of the different kinds of research done, you know, I talked to I, uh, the language I use, and we all have slightly different language to sort of describe the same things, but we've got this creativity driven research that tends to be, you know, based on what are the open questions, what does the world want to know, what does the literature suggest, what is what is interesting, and then we've got the sort of more impact driven, where it's like, what's the question that's right in front of me that I need to solve, um, and what you really want is everybody to be working towards a similar strategic north star um, with various different flexibility there where some people are kind of working towards that north star with some flexibility and some people are doing that to address um, existing problems and i think doing the translation between the ways that people think about the problems is a real challenge um, we have some approaches that we've tried to do it, do it but i'm also really interested in learning from the other panelists um, one of the things that we do, for example, is we um, have started an internship program that uh, bridges across product and research, as an example, and that sort of for it. So, so um, we will sponsor interns. So MSR, Microsoft Research, sponsors a lot of um, sort of academic graduate student interns, but we also sponsor a set of interns that have to have a product mentor and a research mentor. And actually we do this, like, it's great. The work they do is great and getting to know the talent is great, but the secret benefit 
of that is it forces researchers and product people on the product team to have these rich conversations about the problems that they need to do and like sort of do that translation in order to make a proposal and to you know share the results out and um, that sort of forcing I, so I'm really interested in like the sort of forcing functions that we can do to kind of at scale help people map big interesting research problems the long-term questions that Manuela was talking about trying to up level stuff from the actual needs that teams have thanks right. Jamie uh Lisa you want to add something yeah I was just going to chime in I think one thing that might be slightly different and I just uh thought I'd mention it is that so with IBM Research, we're actually not part of the product group. It's its own independent uh, division. And we have our own uh, mission that's independent of the product. So it's it's to, you know, we see our mission as advancing science and technology for IBM and for the world, right? That's how we uh, state it, right? And, uh, uh, you know, part of that also means that, uh, so what that means is that our when we say top down, and we do a, a, a mixture of top down and bottoms up. So individual researchers are always, you know, trying to bring forward ideas, hopefully ideas that, you know, could, you know, drive an entire, uh, you know, new field or new line of research or, you know, big efforts. Sometimes they're smaller. It can be something that needs to incubate for a while, but a top-down wouldn't necessarily come from uh, a product uh, division. Instead, you know, top-down, again, if you're trying to advance, you know, science and technology for IBM in the world, you know, it, it needs to be uh, new things uh, as well. It needs to be things where we're saying, okay, if we're looking at how science or technology is advancing, then it's really important for us to invest enough in a particular area and these sorts of things. So those kinds of things might come more as a top down as opposed to top down towards a product. Now we we do, uh, you know, as we're doing our research and going along, we are uh, understanding at different points, you know, what of these technologies could be valuable to the products, uh, you know, as we kind of mature it and get it to a point where uh, it could be valuable, then we would uh, work with the uh, the product group to try to transfer the technology, ensure that they can stand up, uh, get it as, you know, get it uh, as a product and, and so on. But all of that uh, often happens while we're still, you know, publishing and, uh, you know, doing uh, the research and looking for the next generation of, of algorithms and, and all these sorts of things. So it's possible that, you know, top down, uh, you know, and bottoms up may be a little bit different for each of the, uh, you know, for each of us, but I'm sure there's, there's a lot of, you know, commonalities as, as well. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Uh, uh, sorry, one thing. I mean, it's like at IBM actually. Uh, just so so you know, this AI research group at JP Morgan is separate from all the applied AI, and in some sense, it's that own unit. However, the people who care about AI are all the same. Uh, the business people, the lines of business, they 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 know there is an AI research group there, and they know that there are the applied AI, and so. It's how with whom they interact, but we are definitely a separate unit. Okay, thank you, Manuela. Uh, given the interest of time, I'm going to sort of move to the. Uh, we cannot hear. You. Yeah, we lost you, Manuela. Uh, oh, okay, okay. I, I, for some reason, I got on mute. <laughs> I mean, sorry. So um, I would like to move on to the next question. In the interest of time. And uh, the, it's around organization structure. In your uh, introductions, you all basically talked about this a little bit. Uh, how closely the research team, and this is what Jim, as Manuela was saying, how IBM Research and JP Morgan, the AI group, is separate from the product group. It's not embedded. But um, uh, can you, uh, maybe this would be a quick one since you already talked about it. Anything you want to add? How um, closely the research organization is tied with the business and how, in terms of problem selection, as well as uh, collaboration with uh, engineering or uh, the ML scientist teams. So with this, I kind of want to give Ben the microphone. You want to uh, kick off and then maybe this might be a quick one. I think we have been talking about this a little. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think maybe Spotify might be a bit different from the other three companies represented here that research really isn't separate from the product organization at Spotify. Research is kind of a, a core part of the product organization. And um, I, I want to, um, I really agree with what uh, what Jamie said about having a North Star. Um, I think having research be part of the product organization means that we share a North Star goal, we, we share a mission, and everybody is working together to achieve that mission. And that's a big difference for me from from what I experienced in academia, where I felt like you know every every lab, every professor, every department it kind of has its own mission, and um, there's not a lot of alignment. And um, 
the point Jamie made about translating between you know product teams and research teams is really important also. And um, having that North Star, having that common mission, I think really incentivizes us to work on translating, um, you know, work on how we communicate with the other teams. Um, within Spotify, because we are a small organization, a lot of that um, communication and translation happens on kind of a one-to-one -one basis, like on the personal relationships that we built up over time. And so we find it really important to maintain those personal relationships and work with the, you know, work with people consistently over time. Um, always come back to people if we've, you know, we haven't seen them in a while, we haven't talked to them in a while. Always important to touch base, uh, see what's going on, um, you know, see what's currently on their mind. Um, and um, yeah, so I guess, you know, with regards to the specific question, so how closely is the research organization tied to the business? Um, so yeah, we do have this, this common mission that we're all trying to achieve. And we get our priorities top down, you know, the, the executives tell us what the priorities are for the company, but then within those priorities, we're free to kind of choose what we want to work on and choose where we want to have impact. And um, we try to do that in a way that is going to make it easy for us to justify the research that we're doing, essentially. Um, you know, we, we try to choose projects that are going to have product impact um, and choose projects that are aligned with the um the north stars of the various strategies of the company as well um and i think the point about abstraction is really interesting as well um what i found is that when we work with product teams when we're working closely with the product team there are a lot of detailed questions that we need to answer that may need actually uh, quite a bit of research um, to help the product team come to a to an answer uh, for those questions and um We've, uh, again, I think I said this before, but we have a lot of success embedding a researcher with a product team to really focus on those detailed questions and to understand what the business logic is, you know, to understand the business case for the product and to really kind of investigate those questions deeply. And I think, you know, some of our, some of the research we produce is based on like digging into those details and, um, and really understanding why is this a question or why are we thinking about this this way and what what is novel there um and um i think we we do end up with a lot of specific solutions to specific problems but um but i think we also end up with a lot of really interesting insights by by working that way um so yeah so so researchers embedding with product squads is is pretty much our model of working um, but researchers can also be separate and talk to a number of different product squads at the same time. Uh, we really encourage building relationships with product teams and with product managers and engineers and um, and leveraging those relationships to have impact on the, the business objectives of the company. Thanks, Ben. Anyone wants to add anything? Uh, maybe another uh, aspect of this question is the uh, transfer of the research into the uh, business. Uh, uh, at what point you kind of start the collaboration and how, how maybe you can also point from uh, discuss from those perspectives. And I also I wanted to just because we're a little if, if Manuel and Lisa are sort of separate from product and Ben is talking about embedded in product. Yeah. I'll say one of the things that we're doing is exploring that range. So we've got a bunch of research that happens in MSR and a bunch of research that happens in the product teams. And one of the things that's super interesting about that yeah, is actually you're gonna and well, the folks will talk about the 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 transfer or the connections. It creates this broad, different range of ways um, that people can connect. But one of the things that I find interesting too is is the way it allows us to sort of scale with priorities to be able to as product teams grow or we, the company invests in areas, uh, you know, that we can grow out. And when you start imagining um, research as a as an integral part of like the product development group that includes design and software engineering and also research. Um, I think that becomes interesting. And so I run, for example, a program called MADAP, which stands for the Microsoft AI De Development Acceleration Program. It's a very long acronym, which is dumb, but marketing people came up with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we actually very explicitly hire in cohorts of people into the company along this sort of new model that we are envisioning where there will be a data science, a master's data science, a PhD researcher, and a software engineer and a PM who are part of the cohort uh, to do product development. And that's sort of a way to start modeling and then exporting that kind of culture 
into the organization. So I think there's there's a and there's a different and like I'm excited to hear people because there's very different challenges that you have at those different ends of the spectrum from how you treat what happens to like research tends to have deep expertise in a particular area. What happens? Product teams very often will be like, oh, you're doing something else entirely. <laughs> and that's not something that researchers are as comfortable to do. So you need pathways to, to sort of manage those transitions. Um, so there, there's a um, I, I personally have found having the range super useful um, in order to sort of support some movement back and forth across when stuff like that happens. Uh, anybody else? I think we're already getting into the next questions about talent, but anybody want to say anything about the organizational interaction? Uh, okay, may, uh, I mean, Jamie, you already started talking about talent, what qualities you look when you are recruiting, you already mentioned one program, maybe you can uh, uh, articulate a little further. Uh, and what could the universities be doing to better prepare uh, the workforce for these different roles, right? There, there's different research roles as well, and uh, and some of the career paths uh, people could expect in uh, industry, industrial research to be. <laughs> well, I feel bad having just talked. Like, why don't Lisa? Do you want to start with that? Or <laughs> yeah, sure. We could basically. Yeah, sorry. So the um, uh, sorry, I missed the uh, I missed part of the, the the main point of the question. <laughs> so could you just repeat the uh, the talent? How do you basically? Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, and so, how uh, can academicians better prepare students for uh, uh, industrial research jobs? Right. So we um, okay. So we uh, I would say that IBM Research is probably about seventy five percent PhDs, and then about twenty five percent. You know, these aren't exact numbers, but about twenty five percent are. So our, uh, you know, our uh, software engineers, hardware engineers, data scientists, uh, uh, so not PhDs. And um, I think in terms of, you know, the talent uh, and preparing people uh, for these roles, right? Maybe one of the things would be to try to, we see a mix, a range of uh, when students get involved in, you know, I guess speaking from my own perspective, right, from when they get involved with, you know, AI and AI systems and data, you know, real data and these sorts of things can range quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I believe involving them as early as possible would be really good, uh, would be really help, helpful for us. I think also something that could be introduced uh, possibly earlier that could be helpful for us would be more like uh, experimental design, right? So, what is the question I'm I'm asking, right? How do I, how do I, you know, go about investigating it, uh, gaining evidence, uh, you know, communicating my results, these sorts of things. I I feel like some of that only really comes in uh, PhD, and it would be great if it would come in um, a little bit uh, earlier in the the program. Um, we see a mix as well as when uh, when students get involved in research projects. I mean, we see. What's interesting is, I mean, we see people, you know, high school students now doing projects with AI, ML, all of these sorts of things. And so uh, it seems like there could be, you know, more research, uh, more undergraduate research. I think a lot of universities do really well with that, but it, it does seem like it's, it's, it's kind of mixed. And uh, I think that, um, you know, that could, that could definitely be helpful for us as well. Okay, so can I say just one more yes. thing and then I have to leave, I'm sorry. So I think that this uh, talent question exactly like Liz was saying is very interesting. I actually think that the model we have now is pretty good uh, in which academia encourages students, PhD students to do summer internships with uh, different industries. I I mean, I love my summer interns and I love uh, what I learned from them and what they bring to the group and what we tell them that the real world is about in our industry. So I'm very happy with the model we have. Uh, one thing that I find is that uh, through also these other vehicles that we found like the, the PhD kind of fellowships, the faculty research awards, uh, we, we engage more and more with the academia and one way or another as a side effect with uh, how they are trained. Uh, and so I also at Carnegie Mellon and I'm invited at several other places to come and give like lectures on AI and finance in the multiple courses. 
uh, that are taught. So I go and I teach there. Uh, another other things we do, we have capstone projects that we engage with the local universities, NYU and uh, uh, Cornell Tech, and uh, eventually come these opportunities and we say yes. So uh, I think that we are all very busy to do much more. The academia is very open to uh, understanding the financial world and AI in the finance. So I think it's really, it's a good mixture. I just want to tell one final thought also about like what Ben was saying about these uh, uh, research being within Spotify, like more integrated with the product. It's it's very, so I, 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 I just want to uh, say this again, but I think that research one way or another um, involves uh, publishing, involves uh, keeping the connection. And when the more, little product you build or even a big product we build the, and if it's very proprietary the less you can publish about it so i think that for a research if we're talking about computing research ai research in industry that uh, the the tone has to be about uh, generalizing from the individual use cases i mean or from the transactions we have in the firm to really what is fraud? How do you do fraud detection? What is anomaly? What is residuals? What is like, uh, uh, what is synthetic data? So I think that within our conversation here, which is on research, uh, this abstraction concept uh, is very important. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard for me to publish exactly what we do for fraud detection on the data that's available at JP Morgan Chase, and then we cannot get anything out to the rest of the world. So. Uh, you know, we in this CRA I and this, this is R, I believe the R stands for research. Uh, I think it's uh, important to to emphasize that uh, what we can contribute being in AI research at JP Morgan is more understanding of the financial domain. I wish we had more research units, computing research units and AI research units in health or in agriculture or in all sorts of other climate or in other places in which the more we put people there doing research, the more they will be able to bring out some understanding of the industry and our students can get excited about joining those types of like uh, industries. Anyway, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Jamie in particular. And uh, if you come back to New York, please let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll take you out. Ben, it was very nice meeting you. And of course, Lisa, very nice and Fatma. Thank you all for having Thank you, Maniela. Maniela has to leave. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, bye-bye. Bye, Maniela, thank you. So uh, let's continue with our uh, next set of questions. Uh, anybody, I mean, since we are talking about uh, talent and career paths, maybe another thing to uh, the next question is, what is the incentive structure for getting the work done? How do you incentivize the uh, researchers? And how do you justify the value of the research that is uh, getting done? So uh, can I go to Lisa first? <laughs> Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I would say, you know, uh, we think of, you know, I think we incentivize uh, impact is probably a lot of how we center uh, things. And uh, I noticed that, you know, uh, you know, Jamie, you were kind of, you know, uh, separating impact and, and creativity. Um, and I, I can understand that uh, definition. We, we kind of think of them uh, together. In other words, so we think of when I say impact, right, and incentivize impact, what we're saying is that, okay, we want our researchers to be doing leading edge uh, research and to be, you know, uh, something that is clearly recognized by the community as something that is moving the field forward. So uh, when we, you know, what we're incentivizing are things like, okay, you know, are you publishing, you know, your work? Are you publishing in top conferences and journals uh, that work to really show that it's, you know, it's, it's hitting the bar and it's, it's having an impact? Um, we, we also think, but we also think in terms of time, right? So uh, what happens is that, uh, for example, even though, you know, we're, we're going for these top conferences and journals, maybe the right thing when something is emerging is to go first to a workshop. And so if you were able to show impact that says, okay, well, look, you know, I had this paper, this workshop paper, and then I, I had this workshop. And then, you know, now you're seeing this many papers in the field and things like that. So to show that you were able to have some impact on the, the field. Um, so it could be, you know, uh, you know, citations uh, showing that best papers, you know, uh, you know, we also look at impact that says, okay, well, uh, great. You know, you had the paper, uh, 
you know, did you release the code, right? Did you put the, you know, make your Git uh, repo accessible so that people could get to it? Are people, you know, forking it, starring it? Is it starting to be a, you know, a movement, uh, you know, or, you know, you wrote the paper, this seems like an algorithm that could be beneficial to the product group. Have you, you know, have you been able to, to get any of this into a product or, or these sorts of things? So, so we think of, uh, you know, impact across, you know, all of these different uh, lines. And what I would say is that um, we see people gravitating to what they, what they enjoy to a certain extent, right? So some people, you don't have to incentivize them to do papers, right? That's what they want to do. They want to publish. They want to get that recognition of the community. Uh, other people, you don't have to incentivize them. They want to be, they want to get their technology into products. They want to see it in the hands of people, people using it and getting that sort of uh, feedback. So, um, and then we have people that kind of want to, you know, migrate across and back and, and these sorts of things. So I would say that, you know, uh, for us, it's less about how to incentivize them to do that. It's trying to make sure that we have sort of constructs where they can be recognized uh, when they do have uh, impact and that they can, you know, feel, you know, kind of uh, feel proud of that uh, research in whatever ways they, you know, they like to, uh, to, to do that. So. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Jamie or Ben, do you want to add anything? I'll, I'll speak quickly, Emma. Like I use impact. Like every everybody everybody should be having impact, and actually everybody should be creative as well. So I use those words more just as a um, you know as a catch all than a uh, so the impact there very specifically defines to impact on the company's strategic goals and alignment with our OKRs and sort of the um, the things that the company is is actively driving, and I think. Um, there's a really like measuring and incentivizing work that works towards this sort of up-leveled strategic long-term that we've talking about. That's not just like the impact on this quarter's financials it is, is hard to do. And in the academic community, we do have some ways we have H indexes and publication counts and conference prestige ratings and things like that, um, which we, which we, you know, we complain about in the academic world too, and are like, oh yes, we don't want somebody who just publishes a gazillion papers, but we want them doing good work. Um, so it's, it, I think really figuring out the long-term impact of things and, and being able to see not just how it helps the current problem, but it crews to longer goals is a really big challenge and I don't know the answer to it. And, um, and would love to, <laughs> would love to, would love to, <laughs> would love to know that answer. It's very interesting. So one of the things that I do, I, I work hard, and actually I view as part of my job, as uh, like as 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 leadership is protecting research from too much emphasis on OKRs or goals or measurable things, so that we can be doing that. But it's, you know, it it um, it takes a lot of work, and it's it's hard to do at scale. So and and I think a lot about how to scale. Um, how to scale things. And actually, and, and, and this makes me think it's not, un, it, it makes me think a little bit too of the conversation that we were having just earlier about talent. And so we were talking a lot about how you bring in external talent, but another thing is how you grow internal talent within an organization. Um, because impact matters there too. That's what you want to reward and incent. And um, research is a really interesting world in, in, like the academic community is set up to sort of measure this long-term impact and be able to, you know, you get tenure after seven years, <laughs> you look at the, and, um, and uh, product teams, like in the, there, there's, there's different kinds of paths. That, and, and I don't, again, this is something I don't have an answer towards, but like there's some path, there's different paths in where you grow. Like in research, we often provide a lot of stability in the particular role to allow for that long-term creativity and thinking and product teams, there's a lot of fluctuation and movement. When I was in MSR, I got to study everything, but I got frustrated that I never had like the rug pulled out for me and something too hard, like forced on me. And instead I had to figure out what was too hard all on my own. And in the product land, there's a lot more churn, but there's like known paths to go. And actually when I think about what students need too, is that ability to like, a lot of uh, it, it's that internal sort of responsibility and the creation of your own path and your own and and that's hard and I think it's also our responsibility as research leaders to think about how we can make that easier. I just unfortunately don't yet know the answer, so maybe CRA can figure it out for us. 
Uh, good. Thank you for the insights. One of the other things I kind of wanted to point out, we, we have been talking and I think Manuela kind of got into a little bit in her introduction is incentive, incentives and how the business goals is also this tension of shorter term and longer term term different horizon research and how do you balance the portfolio right so anybody wants to make a comment on that it is a constant tension figuring out where to sort of uh, uh focus it. while i mean academic impact is more longer term uh, uh work whereas business impact is supposed to be the uh, helping the business tomorrow there's that tension in industry if anybody wants to talk about that Um, I can I can mention one thing. Um, so the um, it's something that we've done recently, I would say, kind of a change that we've done uh, recently. So we've we've always sort of looked at this portfolio of um, science goals as well as business goals and trying to always you know balance. Do we have the right mix here? Right? How much is dedicated towards science? How much is dedicated towards uh, you know business impact? And uh, one of the things that we've done recently is to just make that a lot more explicit and measured. Right? Is okay. Which which of these projects are really science led? Which of these projects are truly uh, you know business led? It can be a mix, right? It's not that a business led project wouldn't also have publications. It's not that a science project might not have some things that make it into a product. It's just that like what's the main driver, right? And so, you know, measuring that, you know, being more explicit on what's the the driver of it, you know, counting those, um, you know, then assessing how they are working out over time uh, and what they're producing. Uh, we've also gotten more explicit in terms of how we measure uh, impact to the product. It used to be that, you know, it was kind of like, well, if the product, you know, keeps collaborating or they keep, you know, uh, you know, directing, requesting additional work with the researchers, that was one measure. But now uh, we actually count and look at and say, okay, well, you said you got something into, into the product, all right? Did it uh, bring new users? Was there an inflection point that we can look at the, the product? You know, what, what kind of impact did it actually really have on the so I think we've recently gotten much more explicit about how we measure and um, and count those things, which I think is I think is good because it helps us to do better at being uh, you know conscientiously kind of and more concretely balancing that portfolio in the way that we want to shape it. It may shift sometimes more science, sometimes more business, you know, and uh, but at least we you know it's 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 conscious. You know. Thank you, Me any other thoughts? Maybe we can move on to one. <laughs> the next question, I think, is the uh, natural continuation of um, how is research uh, in industrial setting different from academia? Uh, what makes it similar or different? Uh, and uh, and maybe as uh, I mean, I'll go to Ben, given being <laughs> he had the academic background and now in the industrial. So what are the pros and cons of different uh, settings? So. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I can you know speak to my experience in academia, which is that um, in academia, as you know, as a professor, you're running a research lab. You have graduate students, and you're trying to you know fund those graduate students, you know, support them with um, with uh, stipends, and so you need to get grants. And so it's a you know constant treadmill of writing grants and you know submitting grants to to funding agencies and getting the reviews back and modifying the grants and resubmitting them again and um the um you know it's a it's a lot of pressure i think it's a lot of pressure because you feel like your students are really depending on you to to get those grants and um to help support them and um the difference in industry i think is that in my team um, I don't need to be constantly supporting my team financially. Um, what I need to be supporting my team in is helping them to identify the most impactful opportunities um, among the you know the various choices that they have, and helping them talk to the product teams, helping them remove blockers, and um, it's more of a it, it feels like more of a collaborative process with the people in my team than it did in academia, where it feels like you're trying to get that support so you can get the student to the PhD, you know, to the defense, and then, then they're gone after that, essentially. Uh, so, you know, it's a long, it's more of a long-term relationship with the people in my team and um, more of an evolving relationship. Um, and I think we, you know, it, it's a stronger relationship um, in, in some senses. 
Um, I think another difference for me is what I talked about before with the shared mission and uh, the shared mission that we have in industry versus the um, the very fragmented missions that I've experienced in academia. Uh, it makes collaboration easier. It makes talking to other people easier. It makes pursuing ideas together um, collaboratively easier. And that's something that I've really liked about uh, about industry, about industry research. Um, and uh, I think, um, I'm sorry, I had one more thing and now I'm blanking on what it was. Um, uh, Oh uh, yeah, I, so I want to say something about um, about data and the kinds of problems you work on. So in academia, I was I was a search researcher, and so I worked on search problems. And um, the kind of data that you can get to work on search problems in academia is you know, there's a lot of data available, but it's nothing like the kind of data that say Google has or Twitter has or things like that. And um, I had students who wanted to work on Twitter search problems. And so I could get Twitter data for them and I could, you know, set them loose on that data and they could work on some really interesting problems. Mm -hmm. But you always have this kind of sense that whatever problem they're working on with that data, somebody in Twitter has already thought of that problem and somebody in Twitter has attacked that problem with much more data uh, than we have available in academia. And you can, you know, you can send them to do an internship at Twitter and that's a great opportunity and um, highly recommend, you know, highly recommended that all my students do things like that. Um, but when they come back, it's you know it's difficult to give them a problem that's an academic problem that they can work on, you know, entirely in the academic setting that is relevant to the things that they want to do or relevant to the things that are that are interesting to them or the concerns that they have. And um, that was getting to be more more and more of a struggle in my academic experience. And so, an industry where we have access to the data that's coming from the users directly, the logs, you know, the product data, we have access to the minds of the people who have really thought a lot about that data and thought about what it means and how the users are using the product. Um, that's a really big difference to me um, between industry and academia, and I think it allows us to do much more impactful work in industry, um, even if it's kind of the same same domain, um, search and recommendations. Thank you, Ben. Anybody, Jamie or Lisa, want to add anything? Uh, in the meantime, I want to tell our, all of our participants that uh, we are about to go into the question and uh, Q&A portion of it. If you have your questions, uh, only our panelists can speak up. So if you could just, uh, for the attendees, uh, if you could type your questions in the q and I'll be happy to relay that uh, to our panelists. So uh, any last uh, thoughts before we get into okay so we have one question from Karina Edmonds um so any interest in collaborating with government agencies to tackle big research challenges and uh uh asking for me my many friends at NSF <laughs> she adds <laughs> okay uh, I mean I can say we, we definitely do right uh we collaborate uh with government in, in different forms uh uh, you know, sometimes through, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, through, you know, like open calls uh, for proposals and, you know, nominating uh, there. Uh, we've done some work where we've tried to uh, collaborate with academic partners for their submissions for some of these big NSF centers, even though, you know, we wouldn't uh, get funded uh, through that. But, you know, if it's in an area that's strategic and important for us, then, uh, you know, it helps to in some ways kind of you know, lift all boats, so to speak, is, you know, if, if the university we're collaborating with is giving a larger grant in that area, then that's a, a, a very good uh, thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we do that uh, quite a bit uh, with IBM. Yeah, and I'll be interested in the impact of the new TIP directorate as well. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ben, you want to add anything or we have more questions coming up? Okay, let's move on to the next question. I think there is general interest and in, uh, 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 trying to bring the, the uh, different communities together in this uh, um, initiatives. I guess the uh, the new directors will be interesting. We're all watching. Yeah, and I think the CRAI is also it's you know it's it's government, uh, academia, and industry, right? Is the is the idea? Yeah, so how do we all collaborate together? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say this is also our mission for <laughs> from our industry to uh, try to figure out how we can uh, convene and connect interested parties. So um, yeah, 
uh, and uh, forums like this and workshops are probably uh, the best uh, way to bring people together so that we yeah. get them. And, and find out how we might do better, right? Like we have yeah. ways that we're doing it, but is that the best way? Is that well received? Okay, great. Thank you. So we have more this done there. Uh, what is the length of a typical research project based on product team issue? And I guess this is for all of you, if you want to take it in turn. Uh, then maybe I will start with you, length of a typical research project. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um... Sometimes I think there is no typical research project and everyone had kind of has its own, uh, every project has its own, uh, you know, its own life cycle and things like that. But um, I would say a, a lot of projects are completed with a product team within two quarters to a year. Um, I think that's, you know, that's kind of the range we see with a lot of the, um, a lot of the projects we work on. Sometimes things will go on for a quarter or two quarters and then get dropped for a little while, then come back again um, sometime in the future. And um and um so there's a lot of a lot of variability i would say but i think two quarters to a year is probably probably the typical um typical life cycle thank you lisa or jamie in any order yeah I'd say we probably have very durable uh north stars so there are strategic priorities for the company that persist across research projects but that that i would think research projects um you know, can spin up and spin down much more fast. But um, one of the things that becomes interesting too is how to lean into the research and the work that the innovative work happening within product teams or within research organizations that sort of uh, come from disparate perspectives that make progress towards that North Star. And so then you may see them come together or build or grow. Okay. Lisa, you want to? Yeah, I would probably say it's maybe closest to what uh, Jamie was saying is that, um, you know, for the most part, we have kind of these uh, directions that we're pursuing. And within that, you know, smaller projects may start up certain of these with the product group are, you know, uh, you know, but they tend to be sort of, uh, uh, I would say probably mostly longer term or, uh, you know, kind of, but you know, longer term for the initiative, but maybe the projects kind of going up and down uh, within that. Uh, a project, we see less of where the product team would maybe come to us and say, hey, can you do this very specific thing that would take a quarter? We probably see less of that. What we might see is where the product team might come and say, hey, can you help us with this? And we'd say, well, we, you know, we have some things, <laughs> you know, but we can start in this way, but it's going to take some additional work and, and that sort of thing. And then those can be, you know, as Ben was saying, it's, you know, just, I don't know if there's a typical, it really depends on what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Um, this is Michelle Gardner. Uh, the question is, do you post any of your projects on public platforms like Halo? What is the best way for academia to see where you are seeking collaborators or research support? I think it's very different from various things, but um, uh, Jamie, maybe we start with you first. Yes, so Microsoft Research uh, has a website that is a great place to find where we have um, active engagements, where we are soliciting applications for PhD fellows or interns. Uh, a lot of, we just had the Microsoft Research Summit where we talk about a lot of the problems that are core to the company at the moment. And so I'd recommend that as a really great way um, to look, and I'd actually call out in particular, just because this is an area of research that I've been excited about, is if you check out aka.ms slash NFW, where NFW stands for New Future of Work, you can see a lot of the research that's been happening around changing uh, changing work practices. Um, and I would also say connecting, you know, I think um, everybody who's been talking talks about the engagement with the academic uh, community, publication and attending conferences and things like that. And I think hearing about that, I actually, one of the things that I try to do is I think that there's really interesting questions that come from working closely with the like real world constraints of trying to get things done that can spur interesting research. And so like Ben was even talking about what does it mean to go to an internship and come back? And there's there's um, challenges that you that that you that you can only address often within within a within a company or within a, um, a product team, particularly a scaled product team. Um, 
but there are a lot of questions that are important and I think that ability to sort of look at the kinds of questions that are getting put out by different organizations and, and then to tie it back to what we were talking about and then up leveling them and figuring out what are the like challenges there, um, especially the challenges there that a company can't can't address for some reason, um, you know, maybe because it's disruptive, maybe because it's too long term or maybe you know, for, for whatever reason that might be and diving into that, that becomes that that becomes really interesting and a really rich area for engagement. Thanks, Jamie. Lisa? Yeah, I would say it's similar, right? We have a website, IBM, www.ibm or research.ibm.com, where you can go out and we put out our papers and our projects and all of these sorts of things. There's also like a an IBM research uh, Twitter feed where, you know, we're putting out different information. I think one of the things that's really uh, nice that's different from maybe what was the case in the past, it used to be that we just had a much longer cycle uh, publications. And so by the time you'd know that somebody was working on something, you know, it was at least a year old and, you know, it just wasn't what they were actively engaged in anymore. And now with archive and, you know, social media feeds, you know, Twitter, all of these sorts of things, People are just like rapidly putting all these things out there, you know, putting their stuff out with papers, uh, you know, papers with code and all of these sorts of things. And so I would say that, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's, uh, I think, I think that's good right now. You don't have to assume that it's old and stale research by the time it's getting out there. It's uh, people are rushing to get it out there as quickly as possible. And so, yeah, looking at our website, uh, you know, uh, publications are there, Google Scholar uh, pages, archive, um, IBM comms, Twitter feed, all of these things. Uh, it's pretty easy to see and where we do calls for PhD fellowships or calls for faculty nominations or calls for, uh, you know, as well as, you know, things where we are, you know, new projects or results of projects and these sorts of you know, new collaborations with universities. So. Thank you. Ben? You uh, I, I don't really have, yeah, I don't have much to add. Uh, we also have our research website where we post our publications and data sets that we've released. And um, we sponsored some shared competitions that are, you know, we release data sets and um, we invite participation to, um, you know, to uh, come up with solutions to some tasks on those data sets. Um, then we post our, you know, internship applications and other sorts of applications. We have our Twitter feed. Um, so yeah, very similar to the the previous two answers. Uh, you know, very eager for collaboration um, external to our group also. And uh, we have done a lot of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other question from the audience yet. I uh, I have more questions. <laughs> Maybe we can get back to those. Uh, and uh, one of them is, uh, how do you protect? I mean, it's, I guess, at everybody's in mind, the economic situation right now. How do you protect and make sure some of the investment, the North Stars and the big uh, reaching goals, how do you make sure the research for those continue in this down cycles? Yeah, and we've been through a ton of disruption recently, like we're in the middle of, a, of an economic disruption, we're just coming off a pretty significant disruption in work practices. Uh, and I feel like if, if those two disruptions were top of mind, climate change, <laughs> and all sorts of other things, uh, the political climate, like there, there are all sorts of disruptions happening. And um, you know, I I was actually new in this role as chief scientist when the pandemic hit, and um, and and was very scared about this question. Was was very much like, okay, I'm I'm spinning up in a new initiative and really thinking about how to scale out applied research across the um, entire company. Uh, is this yeah? one of the main ways that companies deal with disruption is to drive efficiencies. So I was worried about being efficiencyed out of a job and, out of, <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, and spent, spent some time churning on that. But uh, actually it was really cool to see another way that companies deal with disruption is actually through research and innovation. And 
uh, COVID's a great example of that with the rapid shift to remote work and the fact that just the amount of innovation needed just to keep teams from falling over when everybody all of a sudden is online and then the innovation needed to figure out how can you help people continue to connect and develop weak ties and manage their well-being and even just figure out how to end a meeting when you don't have someone knocking on the conference room door <laughs> like became became real significant uh, challenges and um I think that's our job as researchers is to figure out how how to lean into the uh, as, especially as industrial researchers, but actually as, as societal researchers, like as researchers, as academic researchers, we should lean into the societal disruptions and the things that are happening. And as industry, you know, and in in companies too, we do that, and particularly in the context of our organization and what it needs to manage through um, and get through get through that disruption. So we. Uh, with COVID that's thinking about, uh, that's very much thinking about how do we help um, people move to remote work and recently figuring out hybrid work. Within economic disruption, that's figuring out like how do we help our customers be more efficient? How do we, there, there's, how do we figure out how to bring, bring them the innovation that they need to manage and weather the cycle? Um, and so I think that's the trick for us. And there's this really interesting thing that I've discovered with research that I don't completely understand yet that is um, research, so researchers, like I was talking earlier, like researchers don't pivot quickly, you put them on a different product team or something, they'll be like, wait, this isn't where I have expertise or anything, we've got this North Star we're working towards. But we pivot quickly in some ways and then as long as we're working in towards the North Star, we've got a lot of flexibility about pro specific problem selection. And so I actually find that the sort of the, that flexibility and research capacity in an organization can actually really help in like quickly mobilizing and leaning in to um, into a disruption and to figuring out how to do that. It requires a significant amount of work of like reprioritization. And I think Ben was talking like that ability to just work through and think about priorities and how you figure that out. Like that's a lot of work. I'm so worn out from just doing that nonstop for, <laughs> for a while. Um, but I think I think it's actually a superpower that research has um, that 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 we can that we can help our organizations leverage. Thanks, Jamie. Lisa. Yeah, I I, um, I agree. I mean, I think like Jamie was saying, I mean, it's just been wave after wave in terms of these uh, disruptions, and so it is a little tiring. <laughs> um, but it it has, like you said, it's been really nice to see you know researchers like you know, during the pandemic, right? You know, you had researchers that, you know, were figuring out how to, you know, 3D print masks and how to, you know, come up with, you know, algorithms that would, you know, give good guidance on how many people we could have in the workspace and things like that. And so it's really interesting to see the, I mean, it's great to work in such a creative environment. And then you see people just like hopping on all these problems that are outside of their area in many cases, but they're, you know, they're, they're just thinking. So I think that's, that's one thing I would definitely agree with what uh, Jamie was saying. I think the other thing that, you know, uh, I realized that's somewhat similar to what uh, Jamie was saying, but uh, slightly different, and that is that uh, in general, uh, you know, I think that companies uh, appreciate kind of the deep expertise of researchers, right? That really deep expertise and that ability because of the deep expertise to be able to go and tackle different types of uh, problems. And so, uh, you know, and and knowing that researchers are these multi-year investments and that they're hard to hire, you know, because, you know, when, you know, when the market is good, uh, you know, it's it's really tough to hire the, the top researcher. In fact, even when the market is bad, sometimes it's difficult to get the top researchers. So I think that in some ways, um, that's a fortunate thing about being part of uh, research is that it, you know, it's it's maybe, you know, quite, quite stable just because of the, you um, you know, the, the realization that these are really difficult, uh, you know, talents to to keep and retain, so. Thank you. I want to get Dan's perspective as well, being a smaller research organization, <laughs> how does that impact on a uh, big economic downturn? Yeah, you know, this is just, just my perspective, but I think what I'm seeing with our researchers is that they are, um, because they really do believe in the company mission. Um, you know, I think our our company really has a it's a really nicely stated mission of you know one million users one or sorry one million one billion users one million creators and Spotify is connecting the users to the creators and it's it's a very it's a mission that is inspiring I think to a lot of people and to the researchers and um, and I do think having an inspiring mission like that really helps them to 
it, it, it helps to kind of smooth things out when they need to pivot quickly to other projects or, you know, they need to dig into something where they, they may not have the expertise already. Um, but knowing that they can help advance the company towards that mission um, and they're helping users, they're helping creators, like they're helping real people. Um, you know, I think that's, that provides a lot of the incentive um, to, to get people to kind of switch directions or, or go into things that they might not know a lot about. And so that, that is something that's very much on the top of my mind right now as I'm planning for 2023 and our research organization is planning for 2023 is uh, I, I think Manuela and others um, on the panel have talked about having a portfolio of different projects where you have some riskier things and you have some uh, short-term payoff kinds of things. And, uh, you know, does that portfolio change when you're in an economic downturn? Um, you know, do you need to focus more on the shorter term, on the, on the less risky? Um, can you still find some way to think about the longer term? Um, can you still find some way to, to do more risky projects? Um, you know, can you find some way to align those projects with the company, you know, to align them with company strategies such that you are generating results in the short term, um, even though you have long-term ambitions for those projects? Um, and then thinking about how we can use the expertises that we have across our research organization, our very small research organization. Um, you know, how can we get people working together across the labs, you know, across the different kind of core areas that we have and um, and really, really push things forward um, and demonstrate our value even in a uh, in a tight economic environment. Um, very much at the top of my mind right now. I can't, you know, like, I think like <laughs> Jamie has said, I, I don't have answers to these things, but um, but uh, it's a it's an interesting problem for me. And I think, you know, that's another thing about research is that um, being able to apply our creativity to new problems, I think, is something that all researchers like to do. And um, giving people the opportunity to do that, uh, I've, I've found generally that uh, they'll just sink their teeth into it and um, and they'll run with it. So, and it is, I think, to, it's an important point that that you both raised. And, and Lisa, I was particularly sure, like the importance of like the quality of this talent and that research talent, like, is moves differently and I, it is it is something that as leaders we are responsible for in our organizations too to provide some of that consistency over time and so and, and I think it's a really important like nobody um, when a company is excited and growing and building out and hiring lots of folks like I think that is the time that research leadership needs to be thinking about how to manage long term through disruptions as well and provide that stability. Um, and it is it is it is a good like as we think about CRAI and we think about the kinds of things we want to think about how do we how do we help organizations and uh, industrial research labs and uh, um, be able to bridge and 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 do the long term thinking that is required. Yeah, and the, and the reason I want to bring it up is because I think sometimes people it's it, maybe it's a little counterintuitive. I think sometimes people might think, oh well, research. Surely we could get rid of that. <laughs> it's it's not really how it works. It's right? the worst it's, thing. To, it's, it's not the thing that's sort of like not, gets yeah, to come yeah, and go yeah. fast. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So because it just it just can't. It can't come and go fast, right? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we are coming to the top of the <laughs> time we have, uh, but I would like to take this time. Uh, uh, we have a survey. If you could all uh, wanna uh, take the survey, and uh, we all, as CI Industries, mission to bring the, all interested parties together from government, uh, funding agencies, academia, and industry. Uh, please visit our uh, web pages. We wanna hear uh, from you, and we want to basically. We have various events coming up. Uh, please uh, participate. Uh, with that, I would like to give each one of you maybe one minute for a closing talk, <laughs> just as a uh, wrap up. Uh, Lisa, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, maybe just, uh, I think we've talked a lot, but um, the uh, just as a wrap up, uh, I'm really excited about the fact that this, uh, this group, the CRA industry has uh, gotten started because I think it's a time that's, that's really come, right? I mean, we we keep we're always like evolving and trying to improve on how we you know organize our own research how we organize with uh, and collaborate with academia how we collaborate with the, with government and so on and so and i think there are some things that we can do uh, better so you know i think the more we can hear from people in terms of you know ideas that they may have on how we could have better uh, collaborations that would be great and i think that's you know that's the purpose of this this group is to try to see if we can help uh, with that thank you 
uh, Ben, any closing <laughs> statement? Thank you. Just, um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for organizing the panel and for the, the great questions and discussion. And um, and uh, I'm also really excited about the CRA industry um, group. And um, in my former life, well, my current life still also, but uh, I've been very involved with ACM, ACM volunteering. And, um, and uh, I've been able to, through my involvement with ACM, support some of the CRA events and um, looking forward to um, just uh, being more involved with the CRA also, if that's, uh, if that's in the cards. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Ben. And Jamie? Um, I might I might harken back to something I said at the start, where I very much think that the current moment that we're in with all the disruption that we were just talking about requires a fundamentally new mindset for, or for businesses um, and how they run, and it really requires a scientist's mindset. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about how we support research in organizations, how we help uh, help organizations build on the state of the art and what is known versus reinventing things, how we share that back so that we can get critical feedback and uh, help expand what is, you know, what the knowledge in the world to, to, to support further innovation. And I think that we're pretty lucky um, to, to, to be where we are and have the training and skills that we need to, to be able to address a lot of, a lot of the challenges ahead. Thank you all. I want to basically conclude uh, uh, by thank you all of, of uh, you for uh, spending time and for a very uh, very lively discussion. Uh, this is close to <laughs> our hearts in the CRA industry. We really would like to basically uh, instead uh, help uh, move the uh, whole computing research industry forward together with all of its constituents. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and you know how to reach us. <laughs>